Good afternoon. I'm Carol Chris, the Chancellor at Berkeley, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special Cal Day camp campus conversation. I'm delighted to have with us uh, Jennifer Doudna, Professor Jennifer Doudna, um, uh, who uh, is going to talk with us today. Uh, Dr. Doudna is a biochemist at, here at Berkeley on the faculty. Her groundbreaking development of CRISPR-Cas9, a genome ed editing te engineering technology that allows researchers to edit DNA with collaborator Emmanuel Charpentier earned the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry and forever changed the course of human and agricultural genomics research. She's also the founder and president of the Innovative Genomics Institute, the Li Ka Shing Chancellor's Chair in Biomedical and Health Sciences, and a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, and a member of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the Gladstone Institutes, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she also just recently won the Wolf Prize. Uh, I, we were joking a little bit before this that she's probably the only woman on the planet that's been awarded both the Nobel Prize and also the Wolf Prize in her garden. She's a leader in global public debate on the responsible use of CRISPR and has co-founded and serves on the advisory panel of several companies that use the technology in unique ways. Uh, she is the co-author of A Crack in Creation, a personal account of her research and the societal and ethical implications of gene editing, and Walter Isaacson has just published a book about her. So please welcome Jennifer Doudna, and Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us for this special Cal Day campus conversation. As you know, this is a very special day and week for our newly admitted students. We're excited to offer them this conversation with one of Berkeley's newest Nobel Prize winners. And I'm certain we have viewers who already know that the sciences will be their chosen field of study. But for those who are just beginning to explore their academic journeys, could you please talk to us about your groundbreaking research and tell us exactly what CRISPR is? It's a great pleasure to be here, Chancellor Chris, and, and such an honor to represent Berkeley. I've been a Berkeley faculty member for almost 20 years and it's been an extraordinary experience. I can't imagine a better place to do science and, and work and live with uh, just an incredible environment of intellectual opportunities and beyond. Yeah, so CRISPR, um, it really started here at Berkeley for me certainly and in many ways for the whole field because the first uh, person who uh, recognized the importance of some bacterial DNA sequences that were known as CRISPRs was Jillian Banfield, who's a professor here in our College of Natural Resources. And she was the person who called these interesting sequences to my attention before most people had even uh, were, were aware of CRISPR uh, and suggested that it might be an interesting thing to study because at the time there was a an idea in just a few labs around the world that this might be a bacterial immune system. And fast forwarding about 10 years, we ended up working on this. We ended up uh, collaborating with, with Jill Banfield. She's now a scientific director at the Innovative Genomics Institute here at Berkeley. And that work led to a wonderful collaboration with Emmanuel Charpentier, in which we figured out that CRISPR-Cas9 is a protein that operates like molecular scissors. It can cut DNA and it can be programmed to cut DNA at any desired DNA sequence. And that means that scientists now have a tool that can target particular parts of the code of life in any cell and trigger a change to that sequence. And that's really become a transformative technology that allows scientists to not only understand the function of genes, but also to have a way to manipulate DNA sequences that can do things like cure genetic disease or allow us to change the genetic code in plants to provide them with the ability to resist drought or pests. So it really is an exciting time in biology to have this technology at our fingertips. 
That is so exciting. I know you've worked um, uh, uh, some on sickle cell anemia, and I wonder if you could just give an example uh, of, uh, from your work on sickle cell anemia, how this extraordinary techno technological tool will be able to change lives. Sickle cell anemia is a great example of a, of a disease that has been studied for decades. And in fact, going all the way back to Linus Pauling, you know, there was an investigation into the origin of sickle cell disease. And it's, now, it's been known for a long time to result from a mutation in one gene in the human genome, the gene that, that encodes an important protein that helps our blood cells carry oxygen. And when that gene is mutated and when somebody inherits two copies of that mutated gene, they end up making a form of the hemoglobin protein that carries oxygen that is prone to aggregation and it gives rise to the classic sickle shape of their red blood cells. And this leads to just extraordinary uh, physiological problems over the course of their lifetime and is really not certainly today uh, up until uh, CRISPR came along was not a curable disease. It was something that doctors would simply try to mitigate and you know, control pain for those patients. And now with CRISPR, we have a technology that can literally correct that disease causing mutation at the source or can turn on another gene called fetal hemoglobin that can override that mutation in people that are affected. And this has already been achieved in a small number of patients. So we know that it will work, which is very, very exciting. However, it's still very expensive. So right now, this is a technology that costs at least $2 million per patient. And so at the Innovative Genomics Institute and here at UC Berkeley, we think that one of the most important things that we can do as scientists is to figure out how to make our discoveries and our technology affordable and accessible to people that can benefit from it. So that's really been a motivation from the very start of this uh, institute at Berkeley is how do we do this? And I'm really excited and, and Chancellor Chris, what you're alluding to is that very recently the Food and Drug Administration in the US has issued what's called an IND, an investigational new drug approval to a three campus collaboration that includes UC Berkeley, UCSF and UCLA to start a clinical trial to treat people that are affected with sickle cell disease using our version of a CRISPR therapy and with a very clear set of steps in place to eventually make this an affordable technology. And I, to my knowledge, it's, it's really uh, certainly one of, if not the uh, first example of a nonprofit consortium getting an IND so that we can actually proceed with this kind of, of vision for creating an affordable therapy that will be ultimately available to those that need it. That is so exciting. Can you have, I've heard so many people talk about um, CRISPR um, with great excitement, not only in relationship to medical applications, but also in relationship to agriculture. Could you give an example from the world of agriculture in which this might, um, CRISPR technology might have a profound impact on human lives? Well, CRISPR is, you know, is, as you alluded to, is an interesting example of a technology that is truly cross-cutting, meaning that anything that has DNA is a subject for CRISPR and editing. And so of course, plants fall in that category. And from very early days of this technology, it was clear that there would be amazing opportunities to use CRISPR in a way that would allow scientists to discover new functions of plant genes, but also importantly, to change them when it made sense to do so. And so we have uh, initiated a, a quite, a, quite a large scale effort at the Innovative Genomics Institute based at, at Berkeley to figure out how we can use CRISPR in ways that will mitigate the effects of climate change, something that especially here in California, but really in many places now, uh, we're really experiencing those uh, impacts in real time. So we know there's real urgency here. How do we use CRISPR to deal with climate change? Well, a um, couple of big ideas that we have, one involves using CRISPR to modify the, the genes in rice to allow these plants to be Higher, higher yield producers, to allow them to grow under drier conditions, and importantly, to allow farmers to, to uh, propagate and cultivate these plants without having to use the kind of 
fertilizers that have been traditionally required. And our goal in the end, our sort of long-term vision for this is zero carbon, sort of net, net zero carbon uh, 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 release for, for farming. And so that's, that's one very important goal of the Institute right now. And then going along with that is being able to edit the DNA in soil microorganisms that are involved in carbon capture. Imagine that we could give them the ability to more efficiently capture carbon in the soil. It's a big sink. And we think there's a, a really interesting opportunity there as well. And I'm delighted that this is also, again, it's very exemplary of what we do at the IGI. We're highly collaborative. So this involves working with companies as well as uh, wonderful plant biologists here at Berkeley, at UC Davis, and at, um, in other organizations that are affiliated with the, uh, these campuses and with the Bay Area. It was so moving to me about uh, all of the aspects of your work at the IGI is how you are so mindful of the benefits to the public good, to humanity, to the planet, that that's really so exciting to have these tools to make the world a better place. I wanted to ask, there's so much to discuss, but I'd like to start with a question that's come up from one of our current students. As a scholar in the field doing trailblazing research, what inspires you? I know you teach the most introductory course in the biology department, Bio 1A. What inspires you to teach that? I think Bio 1A at Berkeley is, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly important course. It's a very exciting opportunity for incoming students who are beginning to learn about uh, biology at, this, at the college level to get introduced to all kinds of fascinating uh, aspects of the field that, you know, they may either not have been exposed to before or have only heard about in a cursory fashion. And so, you know, for me, it's really an exciting time when I can interact with students fairly early in their, their uh, college work to hopefully get them very excited about this field and see, see the opportunities to experience what I have always enjoyed about science, which is the process of discovery. You know, it's not about, um, it's not about uh, you know, boring old facts that are in textbooks. It's about all the things that we're still learning about our world and, and all the questions that are still out there to be addressed and you know, very important ways that all of us can have an impact in a positive way on our, our planet and on, on humanity in general by acquiring general knowledge about our biological you know, environment, but also by thinking about how our discoveries can solve real world problems. Yeah, one of the things that I've learned over my years in the university is um, how much our very um, uh, 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 most, you know, um, our professors that have done the most trailblazing work really enjoy teaching uh, beginning classes in their subjects. And I think it is just a rare gift to be able to synthesize and present the very fundamentals of your discipline to, um, to, a, to, to a set of beginning students. And I know Saul Perlmutter, who's another one of our um, Nobel Prize winners um, in, in physics, um, uh, teaches uh, freshmen as well, and uh, really says that that's some of the most rewarding teaching that, that he does. So clearly you're um, uh, 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 one of very few women who have won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. What advice would you give to anyone and especially young women who are interested in pursuing science? I certainly think that, um, that anybody can do it. I really do. I, I, you know, and I, I'm in a way a great, great example of that because I, you know, I grew up in a small town in Hawaii uh, nobody in my family was a scientist. My, my dad was an academic. He was a, a literature professor at the University of Hawaii. He loved reading, which was uh, one of the ways that I got exposed to some interesting uh, science early on in my life. But, um, but other than that, you know, it was really just, you know, it was just about my own curiosity, my interests, and um, being kind of doggedly, sometimes stubbornly <laughs> refusing to be dissuaded from, you know, from my path. Um, so I, I certainly think that, uh, that that's, that's an important takeaway from you know, my experience, certainly. And also, I would say that uh, I think it's very important to be 
driven by your uh, your passions and your interests. You know, figuring. I think that's one of the things that happens when you go to college, and then if you go on in your your education, if you go to graduate school, you know, you really start exploring who you are as as a scientist. If you're if you're in science, and you know, what what level, what kind of questions do you enjoy answering and addressing, and how do you like to do science? And that's something that I really, really enjoy about, you know, teaching and, and conducting research at Berkeley is that we have students that come from all over the world to our wonderful university because they are, you know, driven by their passions and their interests. And um, they, they have, you know, wide ranging, um, you know, expertise and ideas. And that's really what makes it so interesting to, to pursue science. So I certainly, encourage students to, to, you know, be open to, to new ideas and, and really to, um, you know, never, never let people uh, dissuade you. If you're convinced that your idea is interesting to, you know, to really be persistent in going after it. Do you remember, was there a point in your growing up where you thought, where, where, where the passion of science um, uh, was, you know, really hit you? Is, was there any particular moment or event that awakened your passion for science or was it a more gradual thing? Well, there, there were a couple of things. I, I guess, um, you know, I had always enjoyed math and I, you know, I, 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 you know, I can remember from early days, you know, enjoying kind of, you know, the puzzles that one would solve in mathematics and doing, doing those with my dad in the evening kind of thing when I was, you know, quite young. And then um, when I got a little bit older, I got into uh, high school and we had to take a vocational aptitude battery test uh, by, uh, by the uh, military. I don't, I don't know why we had to do this, but, you know, we did. And uh, the purpose was to, uh, you know, you, you took a bunch of uh, sort of quantitative uh, types of, of tests and then you got a score that would tell you kind of look down this list and it'd say, well, if your score was here, you know, this is what the kind of career that you would be good at. And so for me, it came back that my, my best career would be civil engineering. <laughs> and, you know, I had, I had no idea even what engineering was, much less what was civil about it, you know, and, <laughs> uh, but that was the, you know, I, it sticks out in my mind because, uh, because it, it was kind of the first time that I thought, oh, gosh, I wonder if I could do some kind of science in the future. I had never really thought about it until then. And then I started to, so then I started to think, well, you know, if I did become some kind of a scientist, what, what kind of science would I want to do? And, uh, and then we had, a, we had, again, this was at my, my public high school in Hilo, Hawaii, Hilo High School. They had a program that brought in scientists from around the state of Hawaii who talked about their work. And so we had, you know, we had a marine biologist, we had an astronomer, we had a volcanologist, we had a geologist, you know, you can imagine, right? And then we had a wonderful uh, woman who came in from the cancer center on Oahu and she talked to, she said, I'm a biochemist. And what I do is I am fascinated by the question of how cells grow and what makes them grow out of control, which is what happens when cancer uh, occurs. And so I listened to her talk and I just, I, it was just mesmerizing to me. And I thought that is exactly what I want to do. I want to figure that I want to understand the molecules that are responsible for, for life really. And so, and that really set me on the path of thinking, well, I want to do biochemistry and where do I do it? And, you know, and so for me, that was kind of the turning point when I said, you know, and I, and I never really got too far off that track. There were a few times when I, I questioned it, but, you know, for the most part, after that uh, moment in high school, I really uh, pursued that goal. That's a, a wonderful story. It, you've spoken about being an outsider as um, a young person growing up in Hawaii. How did you um, manage through this and come to find a sense of belonging? And then how do you uh, create a sense of belonging in your lab? You know, I grew up in, in Hilo, Hawaii in the 1970s. And you know, when my family arrived there, I was seven years old. And uh, you know, we, we, my father had just completed his dissertation at Michigan. And so we moved from Ann Arbor, Michigan to Hilo, Hawaii. Huge culture shock, huge. And you know, I think my parents didn't really appreciate at the time 
how hard it was. I think, especially for me, I had two younger sisters, but they were so young that for them, you know, maybe it wasn't as much of a, you know, they didn't uh, feel the shock maybe the way that I think I did, but, um, you know, I, I don't look too Hawaiian, right? So, you know, I was, uh, I looked kind of freakish to the kids there. They were, you know, many of them of, uh, you know, Pacific Islander or uh, Asian um, ancestry. And so for that, you know, I was, uh, you know, half a foot taller than most kids. I had, you know, I had blonde hair, I had uh, blue eyes, I had a big nose and I had hairy arms. And believe me, they called that those uh, features to my attention daily. <laughs> so, you know, I had to, I had to make my way through that. And I had to, um, and that, that kind of feeling of being an outsider really persisted all the way through high school, you know, where I kind of always felt like I was, I didn't quite belong. And um, I tried, you know, I did different, different things to, to, uh, you know, to try to fit in. For example, I, I ended up, you know, I was a pretty good runner. So I ended up playing varsity soccer in uh, high school. In fact, I lettered uh, in that sport and uh, I was pretty good at it. So, you know, that gave me an inroad with some of the kids that otherwise might have, you know, rejected me because I was kind of a kind of a kind of a geek in a way. Um, and uh, so I think that was one way. And then, you know, I also kind of found myself, I kind of buried myself in books too, you know, and I did a lot of reading. I spent a lot of time in libraries, whether it was our public library uh, in Hilo or on my, you know, on the campus of the University of Hawaii at Hilo, you know, in the stacks there uh, reading and, and just, you know, I did a lot of thinking and, you know, that's, that's where I kind of explored different ideas that I had. And, you know, this was the, 70s when we were going through the oil crisis. And, um, and so for me, you know, there was, a, there were lots of interesting ideas kicking around at that time about alternative energy. And so I ended up doing lots of reading about that. So, you know, I think those were, you know, it was sort of twofold, you know, trying to do things that helped me fit in a little bit more. And then also just, you know, going with what I really cared about, which was trying to learn more about science. And so how do I, yeah, how do we, you know, how do we create a culture of belonging in like in a laboratory, you know, here at Berkeley, what do we do? Because as we talked about earlier, you know, we have people coming from all over the world, uh, different backgrounds, they, they have different native languages, uh, different cultural traditions. And that's honestly what makes it so wonderful. You know, it's really exciting and interesting to learn about these, these uh, cultural backgrounds and traditions. At the same time, we have to be sensitive to the fact that, you know, it, like I experienced when I was growing up, you know, it might feel a little foreign at, at times, or they might feel, you know, people might feel like, uh, how do I, how do I fit in here? And actually, I think Berkeley in general is, is a great, um, you know, is a great place for, for a multicultural experience, because there are a lot, you know, just there are a lot of people from elsewhere uh, that come here. And that's good. And, um, and then I think that, you know, we try to do things in the lab that will help people get to know each other. Um, you know, it's been a little harder during, during this year of COVID, but even then, you know, people in the lab have come up with really creative ways, even over Zoom to, you know, have uh, social interactions where we get to know each other, telling little stories, you know, asking a question that goes kind of around the, the Zoom grid, you know, getting people to talk about their, their personal experiences. I think that's, really, really important so that people feel included. Yeah, one of the things that was really striking to me in reading A Crack in Creation was how international the team of people was who created uh, CRISPR, um, who discovered CRISPR. Could you talk about that a little bit? I mean, obviously your main collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier is French, although I don't think she was in France when she was working with you. Am I remembering that right? Yeah, and yes. And yeah. I remember there were people from other countries and other nationalities on your team. Yes, absolutely. I think this is one of the things that I, I've found so exciting about, about doing science. I had no idea when I was growing up and dreaming about maybe doing biochemistry someday that it, you know, it is really an international uh, type of profession where we're interacting with scientists globally um, a lot, you know, frequently. And, and the, you know, the CRISPR collaboration is a, a wonderful example of this where Emmanuel Charpentier is a Parisian uh, by, by uh, birth, but by the time I met her, she was actually working as a faculty member at Umea University in Sweden. 
And she had a, a student in her lab, Chris Chylinski, uh, who is Polish, but was working in a lab in Vienna that was uh, a kind of a, uh, a collaborative situation with, with Emmanuel Charpentier in, in Umea, Sweden. And then in my lab at Berkeley, Martin Yinek was from the Czech Republic, but working at Berkeley doing uh, postdoctoral research. And so you put that team together and boy, we're covering quite a few countries there. And, um, and I, here's a little story I love that uh, I think is, is, is really emblematic of, of a couple of things. One is just the you know, serendipity of, of science and of scientific collaboration and of the, you know, honestly, the importance of cultural connection. Because when we started the collaboration with Emmanuel Charpentier's lab, um, that collaboration involved the, the actual research of Martin Yenek at Berkeley and Chris Chylinski in Vienna. And so these two young scientists at the time had not met in person. And in those days we used not Zoom, but Skype. Anybody remember Skype? Uh, and, <laughs> and so over Skype, you know, they met each other and, and started chatting and they quickly realized that they had grown up on opposite sides of the Polish border and they both spoke the same dialect of Polish. I mean, who could have imagined it, right? But it, it turned out to be a really interesting connection that they had. And so that, I think, together with their, you know, their kind of shared scientific passion really helped to cement and accelerate the, the pace of that collaboration. Thank you. So now I'm going to switch, um, uh, switch topics and, and, and ask you about the history of women in science. And, where do you think we are today? I mean, certainly things are really different, even from the beginning of my career. There's so many more women scientists in um, at Berkeley, but how how do you think about the history of women in, in science, and, and and where are we now? Um, well, we've certainly come a long way. I, you know, I I um, I, I read the the biography of Dorothy Hodgkin recently. And it was, you know, fascinating to, to read about her experience. She had, you know, she had several children and her, her research involved travel at a time when travel was, you know, non, non-trivial. And, um, you know, just, just hearing about her, her, you know, the challenges that she had in, in, in her career was uh, so interesting compared to what I've experienced or what I, you know, what I think uh, students who are coming along now would, would experience. That being said, I think, you know, there's still work to be done, no question. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school in the 1980s, it was, uh, it was, you know, quite, quite interesting to me at that time that about half of my classmates were women. And so at the time, you know, I was in my early twenties, I thought, no, oh, there is no problem. There's no issue, you know? And, and then what's happened is, and this has been commented on um, in many other places, there's kind of a, what people refer to as a leaky pipeline, you know, that as, as uh, careers progress, women more frequently tend to, to, to leave the field or, or, or sort of get diverted relative to men. And why is that? Well, there are many reasons for it, um, but I do think that it's a combination of, um, you know, the challenges of just biological challenges that we have, you know, with, with uh, childbearing and having responsibilities for aging parents, often those things come at a time when, you know, we're right at kind of the apex of our career, or if we're in academics, we're, we're trying to, you know, get tenure. And, uh, and then, you know, as one progresses farther along, I have found certainly personally that, um, you know, that, it, it, that uh, you know, there are, are fewer and fewer women, uh, and you, you know this very well, Chancellor Chris, that, you know, at, at sort of in top sort of leadership positions uh, relative to men, and that's still true, although it is changing. And so I just think that, you know, we need to continue to pay attention to it, uh, find ways that will uh, help women to, to advance their careers when they, when they want to. I think, importantly, women need to feel a sense of choice. Um, you know, that, that they can really choose uh, how they want to go and not feel pushed in one direction or another, but to know that if they want to pursue a professional career, whether it's in, in, in a company or, or in, in a, you know, in, in law or, you know, there's so many different areas that science uh, touches on now, not just uh, academic research, but, you know, in all of those areas, I, I do think it's important for women to know that they have opportunities, that um, they have uh, 
you know, there's a, a supportive uh, culture that, that is friendly to families and to uh, children that allow flexibility and things like that. And actually, you know, as you and I were talking about earlier, I think, you know, in the kind of post COVID era, it will be interesting to see if there are some positive changes that now make us all maybe a little bit more receptive to the idea that, you know, work can be, in many cases, can be conducted from, from anywhere. Okay, thank you. Could you talk, talk to us about someone who's one of your greatest mentors and why? Well, um, yeah, you know, there's quite a few uh, people that have obviously had a really big impact on me and, you know, my career. Um, I guess, you know, I, I guess I would, I, maybe I can just mention two. One is, one is my dad, you know, my father really, um, you know, we had a complicated relationship in some ways, but, you know, I think that he, more than anybody else in, in my family, really, um, I think he really just was a super strong supporter of my academic and, and intellectual interests in science, even though he was not a scientist and, you know, didn't know a lot about science, but he's very interested in it. And so we always had that connection. And that, that was true all the way through, you know, when I was in graduate school and beyond was that, you know, he would come to visit me occasionally. And, you know, the first, you know, we'd, we, you know, first thing that happened is, you know, we'd sit down to have a cup of coffee or sit down to have a meal together. And he would lean across the table and say, so tell me what's happening in the lab. And he would really want to know, you know, he didn't want just the five, you know, he didn't want the five second answer. He wanted to really get into it. And so that was so important to me. It was really validating of my, you know, my interest in science. So that, that, that will stick with me forever, for sure. The other person I would like to mention is, um, is my, uh, my college uh, biochemistry professor, uh, Sharon Panasenko. So Sharon Panasenko was a professor at Pomona College, where I was an undergraduate, and uh, she was a newly hired professor when I arrived there. And um, she, you know, she had a reputation of being pretty tough. You know, she was, uh, you know, uh, she, she was quite demanding. And so her biochemistry class was, you know, reputedly one of the, you know, one of the tough classes uh, on campus. And in our, she was in our chemistry department that taught this, this biochemistry class. And, um, and so she, um, you know, when I was taking her class and, you know, having to work pretty darn hard in that class, but loving it. I mean, it was really great, really, really exciting stuff. And she announced one day that she had an opening in her lab for a student to work over the summer. And we could apply, you know, for this. And um, I thought, you know, there were a lot of students were talking about, oh, that would be great. And, you know, I thought, yeah, that would be great. And so, but I thought, you know, I'll never get it. I mean, I, I'm sure I won't, you know, I won't be chosen because I don't know if I'm the best one in the class. And, but I applied anyway, probably because my dad said, yeah, you should apply. Cause that, that would be kind of thing he would say. And so I did, and uh, I don't know how it happened but I got the position in the end. And so that resulted in me working really closely with her, with Dr. Panasenko over the summer and where she trained me herself in her lab. Can you imagine having somebody like that, you know, a very accomplished, you know, person like that, you know, working with little old me. And it was so impactful. I mean, it really was because I really, during that summer, I realized I love this. Like I, could, I couldn't wait to get to the lab every day. You know, I wanted to see the result of the experiment I had done and do the next one and, you know, have the opportunity to bounce around some ideas with my professor one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it was just an extraordinary experience. Are there undergraduates in your lab here at Berkeley? Yes. So this is something I love about Berkeley is that we, we have the opportunity to work with many uh, talented undergraduates. And so we typically have, I don't know, something like about 10 or 12 <laughs> who are working in the lab at any one time. And um, it's been a little harder in the last year, of course. We actually, unfortunately, couldn't have uh, many of those students working in the laboratory, but we continued to have uh, opportunities to have those students working off site. So they could do, you know, they could do literature uh, projects, they could do computational projects, things that they could work on while they were not uh, physically located at the laboratory. And um, honestly, some of the most exciting uh, things that have happened at Berkeley have really involved you know, undergraduates. I mean, there were, we had an undergraduate summer student who was working with Martin Yinnick, for example, on CRISPR-Cas9. 
So, you know, it's been amazing to have these uh, very smart uh, students who come in. They often have ideas that I would have never thought of. And that, that really makes it interesting. So why did you decide to come to Berkeley? I know you were at Yale before you came to Berkeley. Why did you decide to come here? And what is it about this campus that inspires you? Right, so I was, I was on the faculty at Yale from 1994 until I moved to Berkeley in 2002. And you know, don't get me wrong, Yale was a spectacular place for me. I loved it there and I was treated very well there. I had, had incredible, exciting science that we did there and you know, just amazing students and colleagues. Some of my closest uh, friends and colleagues are still uh, you know, from those days at, at Yale, honestly. Um, at the same time, when the opportunity arose for me to uh, consider a position at Berkeley, um, you know, at the time, honestly, I didn't, I didn't really know Berkeley. And at first I thought, well, you know, probably that's a long shot. I probably wouldn't want to move my lab across the country. But uh, lucky for me, I came out and took a look at it. And I, I stayed with Robert Tejan, who is one of our you know, very prominent uh, faculty members here. He kindly hosted me at his home. I didn't even really know him, but he, you know, he just welcomed me into, into his home like, a, like an old friend. And that, that right away set this tone of, wow, this is a really friendly place. And um, I just remember in that first visit how struck I was by the collaborative nature of Berkeley, you know, faculty who would uh, just pop into each other's offices and talk about ideas, students that were you know, collaborating between different laboratories. It just sounded so interesting and so fun. And I mean, some of that went on at Yale too, of course, but you know, Berkeley is a much bigger campus. We have a lot more um, engineering here than certainly was the case at Yale at the time, which was attractive to me, you know, world's best chemistry department, uh, you know, what can I say? I mean, you know, there's just a lot of, a lot of things going on here that I found compelling, not to mention that it's located in a pretty fabulous place. I think I came out and first came out in you know, February or something. I left New Haven, it was uh, snowing. I had to shovel my car out. I got to Berkeley and it was uh, 75 and gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 we are, our recruiting is particularly um, successful in February. Indeed. Uh, I have another question from a student. Did you ever see yourself as winning the Nobel Prize? And what was that day like for you? And, um, and what inspired you to pursue what you did? I certainly never, ever imagined winning the Nobel Prize, believe me. <laughs> I was probably the most surprised person about it. <laughs> um, it just, you know, it's not something that anyone, I don't think, could really plan for or, or expect or, or, you know, kind of work towards in one's career. Um, that being said, yeah, the day of the prize, you know, I got a phone call at, you know, the, in a, uh, uh, the wee hours here in California. It was about, you know, before 3 a.m. Uh, with this news. And it was, you know, just uh, a shock in a way. You know, I just, I was just, I was trying to process that information. It's just really happening. And, um, you know, since then, I think that, you know, it's been, a really interesting experience because I found that maybe the thing that was most, um, you know, you know, I don't know if it's surprising, but it's just kind of interesting about about the the aftermath of, of that announcement is that I think that you know a lot of people that knew me from you know earlier in my life got in touch with me, which was really nice, and also. I heard from a lot of girls and women in particular, both people that I had known uh, in my life, a lot of them from you know, when I was um, in you know, school in Hawaii, but also people that I didn't know uh, from around the world who reached out to say that you know, this had touched them in a certain way. And so I just, I just think that that is, uh, you know, it's important to think about the value of celebrating science, of celebrating the process of fundamental discovery. I think. For many people, that's that's really you know it really does touch them deeply. And the fact that this prize happened to go to two female scientists, you know, as you pointed out, uh, Chancellor Chris, it, it was unusual. And and I think it did sort of speak to the um, the feeling that uh, women's work uh, can be valued the way a man's can. So Berkeley is well known for challenging the status quo in any number of areas. Uh, how have you challenged the status quo and what guides you from within? 
Um, how have I challenged the status quo? Well, I probably have challenged it partly just by being who I am, <laughs> um, in a way, you know, and kind of just doing what I do. And uh, I've never, you know, for better or worse, I've never really, I was never, uh, you know, kind of actively involved in, you know, the Association for Women in Science or the, this type of thing. I, I've always just kind of viewed myself as a scientist. And oh, by the way, I happen to be female, uh, rather than the other way around. And, um, and I think that, that, you know, I've always tried to also to, um, perhaps because of my background in Hawaii, you know, to think about, I try to understand uh, the people, you know, that come to work with me and, and think about their, their cultural background, how that might be impacting their outlook on things, their approach to, you know, science and life and, and uh, you know, I'm very interested in people and I'm interested in teams and you know, how people work together effectively. So that's been something that I guess I've you know, always worked to try to do at Berkeley. And I think it's something Berkeley in general, it's a very encouraging environment for that kind of collaborative interaction, no matter what it is, whether it's in science or anything else. So uh, you're absolutely right that that is very much part of the culture of Berkeley, but there's still too few people of color or minorities, underrepresented minorities in laboratories today. How do we encourage greater diversity and inclusivity in the life sciences or in science in general? Yeah, it's a very important point and it's a very, very um, uh, important issue to me personally, for sure. Uh, why? Well, uh, because I think that, first of all, that, um, you know, it's the right thing to do. I mean, I think everybody should have an opportunity to pursue their dreams and pursue what they're interested in, no matter where they come from. You know, if they want to come and work hard and, and uh, you know, they have a, a passion for something, I think they should be given the, the, the opportunities to do that for sure. And I feel I have in my life benefited from that kind of thing. And I've had to, I've had to fight against, you know, naysayers too. So I, you know, I know that, that you know, I've experienced some of those types of challenges myself. Um, and the other thing is that I think just even from a, just a very pragmatic point of view, I think science and everything else that we do is better when you have more people contributing to it, you know, and more diverse points of view coming into it. And that's been absolutely true in my own little you know, research environment, but I see it more broadly um, in, in other arenas as well. And that is just that you know, when you have people who come from different backgrounds, different perspectives, uh, they bring ideas that maybe none of the rest of us would have thought of. Thank you. So now I'm gonna ask you a question about COVID. I, I got an email from a colleague of yours, Fyodor Ernoff, who told me such an inspiring story. He said at the beginning, we, you know, with the, really at the beginning of the pandemic, um, you called your entire laboratory together at the Innovative Genomics Institute and said, We're, we have to rise up and fight this virus. And, um, and I know that you created a robotics testing laboratory in the IGI to help us do the kind of testing we needed to do on campus. I know that um, various uh, people in, um, in the IGI have changed their research to concentrate on COVID. Could you talk a little bit about your work in relationship to the pandemic and just how you saw your mission as a scientist and a scientific leader during the pandemic? When the pandemic was beginning last year, just in early uh, 2020, I, like many people, I think, didn't realize what was coming at the time. You know, it, it, it was, it was a, a, very, a time of great uncertainty. Nonetheless, it was clear that, um, you know, that we were in for a, a real challenge in a public health sense. How are we going to deal with a highly infectious virus that, um, that you know, could be lethal for, for a large number of people. And, um, and, and yes, as, as Fyodor Ernov described in that, that message, we got together at the Innovative Genomics Institute on the first floor of you know, this building here that's behind me on the Berkeley campus. And, um, and uh, you know, many people were attending virtually, even then, you know, saying, oh, I don't know if I need to, if I want to you know, be coming into contact with people. We had a conversation, I called this meeting um, you know, for the next day, this was in early March, and we had almost 60 people there, either there or virtually there. 
And so there was a tremendous amount of interest in this, uh, people wanting to participate, figure out how they could contribute their scientific expertise to address this public health emergency. And the outcome of that was that, as you mentioned, first and foremost, everybody agreed that the most immediate need was we need to do more testing. We need to know who's infected and um, you know, people who might be infected who didn't know that they were, were infectious. And so that led to setting up a clinical testing lab. We huge thanks uh, to you, Chancellor Chris, and to your team who were absolutely instrumental in, in getting us through the regulatory pipeline to get that done. But that led to a lab that has ended up providing a lot of the, the testing for the campus, as well as for a number of our community healthcare partners. We've been proud to be able to raise quite a bit of philanthropic support for that lab. And that allowed us to provide testing for free to people who were either unsheltered or, um, or first line uh, you know, uh, uh, responders. You know, the fire, a lot of our firefighters ended up being tested routinely at our you know, Berkeley's testing lab, which has been really, really a, a great a feeling of, you know, all, for all of the students and, and postdocs and, and others who volunteered their time, they really have felt like they were able to meet, a, you know, an urgent need at a time when there wasn't any other way to get that kind of testing. And then, as you mentioned, the other thing that's happened that I think is extraordinary is that, you know, we were able to pull together a lot of scientists from around the Bay Area, not only at, uh, in, at, at Berkeley, but also at UCSF, at UC Davis, as well as in a number of companies. So for example, Salesforce, you know, a company that probably a lot of people have heard of. So Salesforce uh, teamed up with us from those very early days. They helped us get the software in place that would allow us to manage all the data that was coming out of the testing lab. And they've continued to be a, a strong uh, partner for the, that effort. And a number of other uh, companies that were also instrumental in helping to get that effort off the ground. And I really think that, you know, it was that original feeling of, you know, coming together scientists at Berkeley saying, you know, we need to address this, this pandemic that created that, again, that sort of that culture of people saying, we want to work together to, to address this need. Do you think CRISPR is going to be important in any way in relationship to COVID-19? Well, it already is, which is, uh, it's so exciting. It's, it's actually, um, it's be, being used right now as a diagnostic. And it's interesting to think about the fact that in nature, sort of in biology, that's kind of way, the, what it does. It, it, in bacteria, bacteria use CRISPR to detect viruses uh -huh. and cut them up. And so what scientists like, uh, we have a large consortium now that's based at the IGI that's developing CRISPR diagnostics. And the strategy there is to, is to take advantage of, of some of these natural capabilities of CRISPR to find a piece of viral genetic material and then signal that they found it. And so we have it, we have sort of created tests now that turn on a, uh, a release of a fluorescent signal when detection of the virus occurs. And that's been a, a great alternative to the traditional ways of, of doing testing, because ultimately I think that this may provide what we call point of care testing, where you could have a little device sitting you know, on a desktop that would allow people to spit in a tube and quickly get a result telling them that either they are clear or that they have possibly an infection that needs to be attended to. Thank you. So it's not um, hard to imagine that CRISPR could be used to do harm. Um, and you've been outspoken about the need to be cautious in editing the human genome. How can we encourage students in the sciences to think about the societal implications of what we do? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, those, those discussions and ideas have to be integrated into our teaching and our, our research from the, you know, the beginning. And um, in my experience, you know, I, I certainly have attended lots of, you know, ethics lectures in the past and, and things like that. But you know, it didn't really come home to me how, how important that is and how real it is until it, you know, it was really in my face with CRISPR that, you know, this is a technology that has extraordinary opportunity, but also some really important risks as well. And so I, what I, what I think, you know, is, um, well, I think a, a couple things in terms of, you know, students that might be coming to Berkeley and thinking about getting into science. One of the things to think about is that I, I think, you know, the Berkeley campus has just an extraordinary 
cache of, of just incredibly brilliant people who are thinking about these issues from all kinds of perspectives. We have a law school, we have lawyers, we have people who are in, in the business school thinking about it from a more of a commercial perspective, but we also have people, you know, we have economists, we have people that think about uh, psychology and sociology and, you know, and, and honestly, uh, we've, you know, we, you know, the group at the Innovative Genomics Institute, we've been able to tap into those intellectual resources because we're based on the Berkeley campus. And I think that's created uh, opportunities. That, you know, we had a number of workshops now and uh, lots of uh, lectures and seminars and things. All of these are open to students. We invite uh, students to not only to attend, but to participate, you know, to ask questions and, and join in because really it's, it's a, you know, it's an ongoing conversation about how do we manage a technology like CRISPR that has so much to offer, but we have to be responsible about how it's used. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the most exciting things about the Berkeley campus is it has um, very, very um, broad excellence across uh, across different fields, and so you can find the you know the the, the uh, law professors or the philosophers who will be eager to engage in um, conversations about the ethical issues that are involved in the uh, extraordinary scientific discoveries that um, take place uh, on the Berkeley campus all the time. Right. So how do you imagine seeing, if you, if you were to look into your crystal ball, what do you, what do you think is gonna happen with CRISPR research in the next five to 10 years? Certainly, I think that we'll see um, increasing applications in clinical medicine. There are already multiple trials going on with sickle cell disease, as we talked about earlier, including one that's based here at Berkeley, which I'm really excited about. And I think we'll see other trials going forward for other blood disorders. Um, we also expect to see therapies for eye disease that are, have a genetic origin. I think that's a, another really exciting development. John Flannery here at Berkeley is, is leading one of those efforts. And, um, and then beyond that, you know, I think uh, within five years, it's entirely possible that we're going to see a um, clinical application of CRISPR for muscular dystrophy. You know, that, that research is also looking very, very promising. We're not doing it ourselves here, but we have a number of uh, collaborators and, and uh, colleagues that are working on it elsewhere. And, um, and then I think that um, there, there's just also a, a huge opportunity to use CRISPR to discover, you know, genetics that we don't know about right now. So we're just kicking off a, a big program uh, right now. It's a collaboration with the Wild Neural Hub, UCSF and UC Berkeley, uh, scientists and students who are, you know, colleagues who are working on using CRISPR to understand the genetics of neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's. And that's, uh, as you know, still a you know, very, very important uh, public health problem. It hasn't really been addressed yet. And I think you know, there's a lot of thinking that you know, we need to do some fundamental biology there really to understand uh, that disease. And then CRISPR will be there potentially also as a therapy on the other end. So uh, at the audience is mostly for this, is mostly um, uh, prospective students. Uh, do you have anything, before we stop, do you have anything in particular you'd like to share with prospective students today? I just wanna share how wonderful a place it is, uh, you know, Berkeley really is. I, I, um, you know, I, I was not a student here, maybe uh, to my detriment, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, now having been a part of the Berkeley community for almost 20 years, it's, it's truly an amazing place to, to, to live and work and, and, and do research and, uh, and, and to be uh, surrounded by so many brilliant minds is, you know, pretty much every day, I kind of pinch myself and say, wow, am I really, <laughs> am I really here? Am I really part of this? Um, you know, before COVID, I used to enjoy walking across the Berkeley campus midday and I'd go out and, you know, make some excuse to, to walk out to get a cup of coffee or something. And I just love the, you know, the buzz of, you know, students walking around, you'd hear snippets of conversation about all kinds of topics that would be, you know, equally interesting um, to just to hear those, those snippets. And uh, just the energy of the campus is something that is hard to, hard to describe in a way. I, I think uh, Chancellor Chris, you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. Um, and we hope we get back to that. Um, um, I, I'm sure we will. 
it's just a, it, it really is just an amazing, amazing place. And I think that students that come to Berkeley have so many opportunities to do either research if they want to do that, to participate in various kinds of clubs, um, to meet people from all kinds of backgrounds who come here uh, to, to live and work and study. My own son is a freshman at Cal this year and he loves it. Even though it's been a, you know, an unusual year in many ways and his classes are virtual right now, but he's met so many uh, other students that are interesting and you know, he's gotten involved in a number of activities that are exciting, even, even with COVID. And so I can only imagine that they'll get even better uh, once we're uh, beyond the pandemic. Yeah, one of the things that I love about Berkeley is I don't think that there is a subject under the face of the sun that there isn't some person at Berkeley that really knows about it, that is pushing back the frontiers of knowledge about that subject. So it's so exciting. You can say, oh, I wonder if the idea I'm thinking about has something to do with this, like your conversation with Joe Banfield that you talked about at the very beginning of this conversation. And you can find somebody who knows about it here. I think you know, of Berkeley as one of the places in the United States where history is happening, whether that history is Kiss CRISPR Cas9, whether it's the free speech movement, but it's and it's really it's just exhilarating to be in a place that in which so much is happening. There are so many really smart people that are trying to uh, uh, make discoveries that are going to make the world a better place. And yep. um, students are a big piece of this. We really hope that you join us in the fall, that you choose to come to Berkeley. You will help change the world if you come here and it will be a place that will transform you. So I just hope you, um, you choose Berkeley. I wanna thank Professor Doudna for this wonderful conversation. Uh, we all look forward to seeing one another when we're back on campus this fall. So thank you. Fiat looks, let there be light, and go Bears. Go Bears.